when people say DeFi, DeFi on top of a centralized protocol, what's in their heads? <laughs> it just it, it doesn't make any it makes no sense. Hey everyone, welcome to the show. I'm here with the one and only Jeff Booth. Jeff, welcome back to the show. Uh, thanks for having me, Preston. Super pleasure to be here. Likewise. So, you know, I've kind of described this as the third interview in a three part series where we're talking about proof of work, energy, why it's so in- important for it to be infused into money. And when I think Jeff Booth, I think first principles. And, <laughs> um, you know, we talked about, a, I mean, it was a good five hours of discussion between Jason and, and Michael in the two preceding episodes. From your point of view, Jeff, give us a first principles energy overview of how you view the world, how you view uh, this idea of, of energy being infused into money. First off, those two interviews with uh, with Michael and um, and Jason, those I think those were fast, fantastic, and they brought kind of new information to this whole idea. So so, smart, yeah, yeah, really great. And and actually, that's if you if you broadly look at this entire ecosystem, that's what it's doing. It's create it's competing for ideas that are sharpening sharpening this frame of reference that in turn changes our world. So how I look at the question you just asked uh, is. Um, kind of what are we in the great universe and, and what does that look like and how does that work? And so if you take through, we borrow energy to the sun, from the sun and, the, and so a plant doesn't require a computer or, or the algorithm to know how to grow, right? but, uh, but it actually does, right? So the way a plant grows is it knows to grow towards the sun and that photosynthesis that creates the plant it uses energy, borrows energy for the, from the sun. Animals then, in turn, feed on that energy um, to create uh, to create uh, to create their uh, an animal, which creates th- their way of life. And we, in turn, feed on that energy through plants or animals to create what we call a thought, uh, and that those thoughts turn into actions. Those actions turn the, into ideas, and those ideas compete for how we organize the world. Technology is actually just one of those thoughts. Technology broadly, the, the word, is just one of those thoughts competing for that, that came up out of our human minds trying to wrap our heads around these ideas. And those ideas constantly create the world we see. They can be wrong for a long time, and we compete to make them better. So we don't. We, our entire world is about solving problems. We look for how do we solve this problem better? How do we find? How do we utilize more energy to be able to solve this problem better? So technology broadly is those just all it is is those ideas um, competing to solve our problems in a better way, and. And that drives the frame of reference that we use to view the world. So you could, uh, why energy is so critical in that state is you, a different way to look at it is, is us as a, in existence, um, essentially slow entropy by borrowing energy from another system outside of our system, the sun. And, and we're the, we are, that slowing of entropy in the universe to create the beautiful thing we call life. How that relates now to how do we coordinate those ideas? Our brains are, our brains, um, if you just said your own brain, um, what could you accomplish in a day? What could you, what could you do? And, and you probably don't see that you require all of the other brains in the world to create coordination of our labor that, create, that creates higher living standards. And that coordination uh, requires trust and a requirement. Uh, and, and so let's just break this for a second. So now you're yourself, there's no one else on the planet. You can, you can hunt, you can, um, what would it take to recreate 
all the things you take for granted in your life. And you could see all of your energy, all of your limited energy, the storage in your brain of information is like a, like a very, very small computer using a limited amount of energy to be able to, to be able to live your life. And most of your day, most of your day would be to protect your, protect yourself from the elements of the world and feed and create more energy for yourself. But when we link those brains together, they form a supercomputer. And the more brains together, because we have limited compute time in our own, in our own heads, and we have limited energy for that compute time. And when we link them together, we create a supercomputer. And the larger integration, more brains connected, create more ideas, require more energy, and more supercompute. And that, that emergent function that, that we call the emergent complex behavior that, uh, that, is, that is the world we live in, the abstract world that we live in, is actually a result of that supercomputer creating more, uh, more ideas. Those ideas challenge other ideas that were held before. They create tension in our world right, and, and opportunity in our world because, because when true, when those new ideas render it, previous idea obsolete there's a whole bunch of people with a frame of reference in that previous idea that can't see it and that's competition is what drives the world and that's that's also the free market and that, and and so the, the linking of more supercompute us our brains creates a dramatic more more ideas now you can see that in evidence around the world where you have, and, and you can see it in, in the evolution of cities, where people moved to the city en masse because there were more ideas. And those more ideas linked together, this go back before computers, um, go back, uh, they, those, or before the internet, those ideas linked together would have more shots on net, more social coordination that could build and refine those ideas. And the bigger cities had more output and had more opportunity and more people raced to those cities to build on other people's ideas. And when you had trust linking that together in money, just in from if money is just information. We'll explore that a little bit more. When you have trust, those cities thrived and they thrived because they produced more of the ideas that the world builds upon. And then if you just follow that in the power law, Smaller cities, smaller towns, smaller regions had less supercompute. So they didn't have as many ideas. They didn't, and, and, um, and look at the inverse of that. Look at large cities with no trust in money and what happened. Mm -hmm. you, and you don't have the supercompute. And so th that, function, that, that function of us in a system, creating more ideas that create higher living standards through productivity is us linking together into a supercomputer when you that say, requires trust when, when you say ideas i'm thinking in terms of energy efficiency it's it's like these ideas that win versus the ones that uh that lose or that change or morph uh over time it seems like the ones that that evolve or that take over are the ones are the ideas that harness energy more efficiently from a collective, uh, connected kind of way. W would you agree with that, or, or am I thinking of using Lar the no, yeah, uh, largely. But but what I would what I, what I might push back on a little bit is you can coordinate that energy through coercion and control. Mm -hmm. um, and the 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 pyramids were built through mm -hmm. coordinating that energy. That's mm -hmm. super. But, but what, it, what you can't do is, is in, in drive more ideas, my drive more human spirit. So coercion and control remove those ideas mm. because, because, and, and that, and that means living standards generally must go down. They could go up for the very few on top controlling those ideas because what you're doing is controlling all of the energy, mm. but the super compute. In fact, it's the very exact same reason why why centralized structures that must make the, all the decisions 
living standards have to go down because there's not as much opportunities. There's not as many because effectively you drive the ideas out of the the slaves mm -hmm. through through uh, through through control. And when you drive the ideas out of control, and people are just automatons in, into a system, they have less ideas, and, and and those ideas competing for a better way of life don't see the light of day. Wow. Okay. So that's, uh, as, as far as like a foundation goes, like this is, uh, a very deep biological kind of point of view. Um, let, let me transition just a little bit, Jeff, you recently wrote an article, um, probably, a, I don't know, a month or two ago. Uh, the title of this article was finding signal in a noisy world. First of all, what was your impetus for writing this? Because I know you're a very busy person and I know writing something like this takes time away from you. So you must have had some type of trigger that was like, all right, God, I'm so tired of explaining this. Or I, I feel like so many people are missing the crux of a very important thing. So I'm going to sit down and I'm going to bang out this big article. So what drove you to do that? We live in a frame of reference and that frame of reference largely is responsible for our um our happiness and our way of life mm -hmm. and so so if if, if to, to me you many of the bitcoiners in this, uh, in this community we live in a frame of reference of truth hope and abundance because we see what is coming on this protocol and mm -hmm. if you get to see all of the entrepreneurs all of those ideas building a better future for all of humanity and the output of all of those ideas you get to see that early. It's hard not to get really excited about no. yeah. this idea. It's such a powerful idea. And as we do that, we go so far down the uh, rabbit hole that we, we might also forget that 99% of the planet, 99.9% .9 of the planet has no idea what we're talking about. Uh, there's no, no clue. <laughs> and many people in this space could look, they could look radical. It could look like a religion. Mm -hmm. And really, it is two competing frames of reference. Yes, competing for attention to drive better out what they believe is better outputs for the world. So that's 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 all it is. And many of the people, and so so why would this look like this, and why would this be so polarizing? And I'm going to add to that: when people have gone down the rabbit hole, like you and me, um, we we also sometimes forget that we once didn't we weren't once down the rabbit hole that we once saw the world in another way as well and that's why even all of what you do bringing on these guests refine these ideas and bring more attention to these ideas and bring more people over to wait if that's true um then it changes my it, it changes my assumption about the way the world looks or could work and how to and how how it could how we could reimagine it, and so when you're on the right side of that, when you're on the right side of uh, or, or that that where the world looks, you're building to hope, you're building to abundance, and and you cannot believe that other people can't see it. Mm -hmm. And so for for me, I wanted to I wanted to explore first why could people why why it would be so hard to understand this transition from the perspective of the world we've always lived in where my, where many of my friends are today and why they might not see that. So that that's why I decided to write it. So the first thing that jumped out to, uh, to me in this article is you say technology adoption is most often bottoms up versus top down. Explain why you think that. Um, a monopoly, a, a monopoly reinforces, they don't actually see a, 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 in a business, you protect the monopoly. Let's use Kodak for an example. Even though Kodak, Kodak invented the digital camera, and Steve Sasson came twice to executives to try to say, "Here's what we could do with it." Kodak's business was supply, largely supply chain, producing film, um, and, and the revenue and the profits were driven by that function. So, when it's driven by that function, all of the ideas making that a better function, better supply chain. More better marketing, better to create the monopoly that was uh, that was Kodak, are driven inside that company, and they're driven to make the company better. 
and enter a new techno technology that completely changes the paradigm of what they do. And they can't see it. And, and what, what is typical, what's very typical in all companies is all of the people driving the last thing have no idea what to do in the new, new thing. And actually, just, just for a moment, let's be them. Mm -hmm. your, your job looks totally different. So there's fear. If you were to move to the new thing, you have no idea how to create actual value of the new thing. It's a totally different skill set mm -hmm. from, driving, from driving that we take thousands, hundreds of thousands of photos today. Editing software is free. All of this is free. And how does somebody who's driven a supply chain of film moving around the planet yeah. right, plug into that? So it's a natural. And how does an entire executive that is, is, is building higher profits for the next quarter think about, wait, this totally eradicates my business if it works. So it is, it is natural um, tension. And what ends up happening is the technology enables the people furthest away from the monopoly. And it enables new entrepreneurs to say, wait, I could use this, this idea and create something totally different through a better idea. Mm -hmm. And that idea, and that idea competes for attention in the same way we talked about before. And that's what we call the free market of ideas. And it's chaotic new frames that only work when they produce better value for us, because we are both the idea creators and the idea consumers driving more and more ideas. And so we're linked. So we don't see that all of our labor is in somebody else's decision to purchase that labor. Mm -hmm. um, and we think they're two discrete um, things. They're not, they're one and the same. So, so everything we do either creates more value for somebody else or doesn't. And so but, so at, a, at the highest level, that is also why it's normal for, for for a company doing kind of a process in, in, in something a bigger company gets, the more centralized it becomes and the less ideas that compete to be able, uh, to be able to create new giant ways forward. So an important quote that I pulled out of the article, um, you, you go through some deduction, uh, you're, you're kind of describing things and then you come to this, uh, deduction, you say, it makes logical sense then that if money is just information, and we can maybe talk a, a little bit about that idea, and two, money is being manipulated by central banks at an unprecedented rate to avoid a credit collapse of the system, then three, misinformation must be growing through the system. And then you say in parentheses, a second order derivative of that misinformation is that trust must be declining throughout the system. You talked a little bit about that in your opening comments, uh, first principles kind of thinking around energy. So my question is this, it, it, as you go through this deduction, is this a linear uh, event or is this a nonlinear parabolic type event where the misinformation must be growing and the uh, breakdown in trust must be declining? Yeah, it's a uh, it's it's exponential, and it's an exponential type. This is what we talked about it in the book. Talked about many times. You have technology trying to through productivity gains of that technology, which is really just our ideas competing in a free market to give us more value. You have that on one axis that's moving at an exponential rate, trying to give us more value. We in turn drive into the things that give us more value driving those companies forward faster and and that value cannot in an inflationary monetary policy transfer to society so it has to it has to move exactly the opposite way and it has to manipulate money to stay solvent so why i wanted to explain in that why human connection to labor or or what we're essentially what we call um, money is so vital in trust and so vital in the supercomputer. That's why the money is just information. And you don't actually want more money. You want more of what you believe money buys you. And so for some people, it's a nice house. But why the nice house? So, so their family has a nice house where they can show off to their friends at their nice house. Or, so 
it's your relationship to what you believe advise you the ledger describing describing what you have and then in your idea what it takes to get what you want so it describes your actions to ideas to create more value for you and more value in so, and, and when your ideas work create more value to society when you actually have so if you understand that it's just information and by the way let's go first go if it wasn't just information then you venezuelan bolivar would be equal to a u.s dollar in your mind right it's, it, why is it not equal because it describes something else it describes the feeling and you're chasing you're chasing the feeling we are all chasing the feeling of what what we want out of that money so now when you apply misinformation to that money um and you automate that in misinformation through us all linking together in social coordination and in that base layer of that effectively that trust holding together a free market is being destroyed then it would be very easy for everyone in that system to to look through that in misinformation and believe that they had the perfect information where they were just a person within that system of more and more misinformation and that system because it's not based on the truth many in bitcoin already know this but many outside of bitcoin don't know it because it's not based on it's based on a lie it's based on inflation is required for a productive society mm-hmm. but but that lie that idea for a large society their frame they believe that lie and so it's really hard to to pull them out of that lie when they believe it so firmly because it's been true in their life and a credit based system has given them their entire way of life i mean that idea alone when you just kind of pull the thread if money is information documenting energy that was expended by each individual that provided value to somebody else and you're saying you're going to debase that ledger by 2% on it you're you're effectively saying i'm taking the global ledger or file of all that information and I'm corrupting it. I'm corrupting the file at a 2% loss annually, right? Yeah. And, and and now if you do that if you do that social coordination and one country wins and one country loses by the exact same output. Yeah. The country that wins for a while will will say, "Wow, this is really a great deal." Mm-hmm. But it has a negative externality somewhere else that must grow. Yes. So now so now when that country that wins or the, the what we call western liberal democracies and uh in the US um the country country that wins becomes the the base currency for the all other currencies reference mm-hmm. and that information what we could say is just information that they would reference when to stay solvent that base currency has to create inflation at a crazy rate for long, for a long term to be able to bring the debt to manageable controls to manage the levels um and every other currency references that rate then the misinformation must be growing at an exponential pace so that this information we might accept that, um gov- uh, countries might accept a a trade off of their labor being worth 2% less per year um for a while but when that when that debasement has to reach 10 and 12 and 14% they start noticing similarly to if somebody came into your house and stole 2% of your stuff you might not notice mm-hmm. if it happens slowly but if somebody came into your house and stole 14% of your stuff you say what's going on and right and 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 so that's 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 what's happening hey so another quote that i pulled out of your article you you say open protocols provide the most value to society and are the hardest to understand why do you think they're so hard to understand for people um because they 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 come in layers the simple answer is they come in layers and you don't see you have no idea what's available to you on the next layer until the next layer is there mm. and so before we go there let's just look at uh, an example kind of tying this free market idea of not a protocol but mm-hmm. a company level by idea and how easy it is to miss that idea and i'm going to use me as an example even though i'm 
I kind of do this. I look for where things are going to change. That's what all entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs into it, the future. Mm -hmm. Um, and they into it, what, what people will do under different circumstances before those people have those circumstances. Mm. And that's why they create these ideas. So let's use the, let's use the, before we go to the protocol, let's just use an idea in a company le uh, level. And when, when iPhone came out, um, I was convinced uh, that I would never use it. Um, because I loved my Blackberry with all the buttons. And that, did you have a Blackberry? Uh, yeah, I did. Yeah, remember as embarrassing as it is, you know, <laughs> you know, we're, we're old enough to know this, and uh, and 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 it was, it, I loved it because it was such an innovation from what came before that, and I was convinced. Blackberry is a massive company. I was convinced I would never change. It was so good. Um, now remember, the iPhone was in development for three years before I saw it. Mm -hmm. It's in secret, and on on a premise of we have a way better idea. Mm -hmm. None of us saw that idea. Mm -hmm. um, and then it came out and me being completely convinced that I would never buy an iPhone changed in a second yeah. and bought, bought an iPhone because it provided me more value, a whole bunch more value, which I couldn't see before it was in my hands. And I couldn't predict the consequences of those actions across industries mm -hmm. before it was in my hands. So that just says wh why it is so hard to understand if you've centralized everything, those ideas stop mm -hmm. because you, it presupposes that the central organization can predict those ideas and the outcome and the response to those ideas better than you can. And that's why it's messy too, because we change our minds. And when we, when given, given new inputs that create a better life for us, we change our minds really quickly. Yeah. Um, and we, we, we don't predict the change. So those are, those are hard to see. So what would a protocol level technology that you can't actually see the output of what's available on top of that um, do to, to people? It would be really, really, if that's hard to understand what we would, how our minds would change, it would be almost impossible to understand what a protocol level te technology would, would do, do and what opportunities that that would open up as it, as it has evolved. And that's where at another area where I think there's so much confusion of Bitcoin and logically why, um, because protocols develop in layers and they take a long time to develop in layer layers because you want to harden that first layer before you add the next layer. Mm. Um, otherwise you're, otherwise you're building castles on the sand. So then it, if you take that concept and you say TCP IP, it was a protocol layer developed by DARPA in the late sixties. And arguably all of this is happening faster today. But, uh, but if you take that concept and say that it was developed by DARPA in the 60s, in the late 60s, it wasn't until HTTP on layer four that connected that stack mm. that, that, that then became the foundation for the World Wide Web and, and linking all of these computers together that then became the foundation of this, this Zoom call we're doing. That then became, but we, didn't, we don't experience, we don't think about TCP IP when we're doing this call because mm -mm. that's a plumbing underneath. Yeah, we think about we think about the products that give us value, and those va and that value can't come until the the, the 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 protocol develops in layers that opens up the next level of value. So now, if you compare that, so now now take take what would be happening in a world of more and more misinformation that had to expand in an exponential pace to be able to protect a credit-based system that was insolvent. So the so information and money, so you'd have that. You'd have all this confusion. And at the same time, you'd have this protocol developing that then created a whole bunch of value for people that were trying to escape a system. They didn't know they were trying to escape a system that was producing worse outcomes. What they, were trying, what they would tell themselves is, well, if I buy two houses instead of one house and I will leave her myself or this or this, I can make more money faster to be, to be able to live a great life. That's what they would tell themselves. So in that, it's getting faster and faster. And then the opposite side of that equation are people's wages are going down in real terms. Mm -hmm. and, and they're finding they're on a hamster wheel that's moving further and further away from them. And they're taking higher and higher risks in that system the entire time to try to escape with enough money to be able to, to imagine it. And then along comes this new protocol. 
this new protocol, Bitcoin, which they don't know is a protocol, Ponzi scheme. They don't know any any of this. They, they, it, may, it makes a whole bunch of people really rich. And those people that are rich are driving around Lambos and, and talking about, and, and, and in this environment, people are going, oh, well, that's just a Ponzi scheme and the system, we've seen these, this thing before, that's going to be dead, not understanding how, how deep this is. At the same time as that protocol is, is layer one is developing, what we call the, the pristine um, neutral reserve asset of, of, of the world, that layer, uh, that layer one is developing. It creates, but that layer one can't scale because it can only do five to seven transactions a, a, a second. It creates an opportunity in the free market to build other things or, or to confuse people, conflate that idea or build other things that, um, that could pr produce value in a different way. New ideas that could produce value uh, in a different way. Ethereum was one of those ideas. And so it makes large, large sense that many of the people that went into Bitcoin and made so much money, and then a new idea that they didn't really understand the protocol level technology as a company or something, that would move into a new idea as well and say, well, I can make a whole bunch of money there and bring a whole bunch of people understanding without understanding the why and how technology develop, develops. So logically, when you look at how this whole thing is shaking out, it's just totally normal. It's human nature mm. in a system that is transitioning that, that all of these other things would exist. It's unreal. When we look at the core, and I think that that's what I was really trying to get at with Michael and, and Jason on the last two interviews is helping people understand this very core idea about energy infusion into a digital unit. You have in this article what I think to be a, a really nice graphic, and you call it the Bitcoin trilemma. And in the triangle, you have scalable, decentralized, and secure. Talk to us about each of these three things, and then talk to us about the quandary that exists in trying to connect all three. Um, and we can go as deep into this as you want. Um, if for people that are that some uh, somewhere down the rabbit hole, they might. Uh, some people will understand what I'm going as when you go into the physics of this really deeply. Some uh, uh, some may not. But let's start at the highest level. So the blockchain trilemma, uh, you can solve two of three sides of that triangle. So so decentralization, security, or scalability. But you can only choose two of three. And I wanted to explain this and then back it up with some simple ways that people could come back to that reference and verify if true mm -hmm. and, and push and share with their friends and verify if true. Um, and, and, and so, so because it's so confusing and people will tell them one thing or another and, and in this mis misinformation, you could, you need to verify. That's why I put that that out. But that trilemma. So if you can only solve two of three, and Bitcoin solved decentralization and security for the first time that humanity has ever seen decentralization and security together, then then it would create a natural free market opening to solve scalability, mm -hmm. because Bitcoin hadn't solved on layer one scalability. So it would be natural that the other ideas would compete to say. Well, Bitcoin's old tech, it's, it only does this well, and you can't do anything. And by the way, if it only does that well, how is venture capital going to make a return? Um, because they're trying to fund new companies and new ideas. So venture capital on top of that layer one, okay, well, I'm not just going to hold an asset. My entire job is to fund new ideas and new... So, so now you have this, let's use Ethereum, which is... Um, you know how far against it I am, but I'm just against it from a um, from it can't work, and I, and we'll go just now. You have Ethereum that comes out and says I'm going to create the world computer, and I'm going to create a world computer because because I'm going to apply smart contracts into this. Um, and the first idea for for Ethereum was that 
and everybody, because of these smart contracts, would build on top of that idea and it would be scalable. And so a bunch of people buy that without the re realization that that scalability on, on layer one comes at a cost of decentralization or security. And, and so, so as that scales and becomes more and more centralized by design, because it, it must, then, then you have this centrally controlled function controlling everything else. When people say DeFi, I, I just, DeFi on top of a centralized protocol. I, 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 what's in their heads? It just, it, it doesn't make any, it, it makes no sense. But by nature of the foundation of the structure of this, it has to centralize. And then as it centralizes, um, which you could say, okay, well, it centralizes. But now you have to look at the economics of that centralization and you have to say, well, the database is a central, uh, centrally designed. It's, it's, it's awfully efficient. Can you imagine Amazon moving their database to a blockchain that is not efficient and costs a lot more because somebody has to pay for that. Either a buyer or seller has to pay for, for that cost in that in a, in efficiency. When if you're using a centralized function, it's just way more efficient. So, so missing that and, 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 and sacrificing decentralization or security for, for, for something that must be centra centralized over time has to lose in the free market. It's impossible for it to win in the free market because, because by design, it can't be as efficient as a database. At, at a company, a company it, level, it, this would be your classic scenario of you know, a product that's not superior to something that's out there, but it has a ton of marketing behind it. And so it's just a matter of time before the market cap of this startup collapses. Um, and you it's, it's, way, it, it, it's way worse. It's way worse because because there's an entire ecosystem built on top of it with a whole oh, bunch of other entre entrepreneurs wow. that wow. believe that believe they're trying and some of them actually believe in their in their idea that they're trying to create value. Hmm. This build on top of a foundation that can't. So it wipes out all of that. But you can imagine if you're an entrepreneur in that system and you've been you don't check the plumbing level, the protocol level, the foundation level. And you believe in that function, and now you've raised a whole bunch of money, and your business is on the line of, of, uh, of that money. What would you rather? What would you do? Would you, would you say, "Oh, jigs up, I'm going to just walk away from my business," or would you try to protect what you have? And and I could, I, I just think you, if you see human nature, people are going to try to protect what they have at any cost, and they will sell others in to try to get into that ecosystem without even knowing the damage that that creates. They're just trying to create value for themselves in their business. It's trying to get out the other side. Similarly to why many companies go public as an event to cash out, mm -hmm. right? So, so they're just trying to get to another place to sell to somebody, some, somebody else in it. And so that would be just natural, but that entire ecosystem that lives on top of it, that for a while gives it strength, makes it worse and worse and worse. In fact, this is something that with Raul Paul um, that I think he just critically misunderstands in this whole ecosystem. And he critically misunderstands it for the same reason that he understood what's happening with network effects. And the same reason he understood network effects or he thought he understood the network effects is from my book. Because in my book, I describe network effects contributing to 70% of all technologies value. And so when you actually look at a network effect, what a network effect requires is every new user of the system makes the system better for all other users. Mm. And if you look at Ethereum or that entire ecosystem, it does exactly the opposite. Every new user of the system makes the system less valuable for all other users because the system itself can't be stable. Mm. But for a while, where we are in a, and we have recency bias for a while when people are making money in there and that money is amplified by another system that is that is that is driving the, another system that's four orders of magnitude bigger that we live in and measure everything else and is driving free money mm. 
this system is going to look, oh, wow, those people are making money and race a whole bunch more people, people in. And it, they won't realize the critical instability of that system. They'll build onto it because they won't do the work to understand the differences. So when you, when you talk about the first time that we've seen decentralized and security optimized for in that blockchain trilemma, why is that particular combo so important? Uh, um, it, this is one of the things that even for me, it absolutely blows my brain and it still does today because our entire social construct, the social construct that we call a democracy, social construct that people call communism, social construct that leads to these outcomes, um, has always been this fight over the state could do it better, free market could do it better, how would how would that look? And 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 I think there's good evidence throughout history that free market does it better because of there's higher living standards over uh, longer term in, uh, um, in free market, more ideas. So there's good evidence throughout history that the free market does that better because we can't predict our actions. And when we, when we get stuck, we create new ideas to be able to solve our stocks. So, you know, a free market allows that to happen at a, at a way different rate than, than a non-free market. But what, what you'd have is, is to, to protect the free market, you would have, you would, you would take, because we never had decentralization and security together, what you would do is you would create laws to protect the free market and or, or, or declarations. And so Magna Carta was one of those declarations and it prescribed the state having less control over people and people having more individual rights and freedom, which drive higher society function, which drive better out output for society, which drives more ideas, which drives higher living standards. Bill of Rights and the Constitution um, are those ideas enshrining those rights and citizens. And one of the reasons why the U.S. became such a superpower is because it had more ideas in the free market competing, competing against other countries that didn't. There was more freedom. And those other countries that didn't, would those people in those other countries would race to the U.S. Mm. And, 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 a, and a bunch of that talent Many of the top companies in the U.S. are created by, by immigrants to the U.S. who never had an opportunity in their system to create those ideas. And in the U.S., they had an opportunity to create uh, those ideas. So, so those rights are almost a firewall to protect us from the state getting too big. Um, but throughout time, that firewall always breaks down because of money. And so... And because money is superordinate to laws in um, in, uh, in in creating that idea, so decentralization and security of, together. Yeah, go ahead. Because of the flaw, the inherent flaws in what the world had used as money up until now. Um, yeah, yeah. Let's not go Bitcoin yet, but let's do this. So, so, but de that why decentralization and security is such a big idea, kind of composed by Bitcoin, is we've never seen that before. So that means if we've never seen that before, all of our recorded history to get to this point mm -hmm. had to be based on what I'm talking about, prescribing laws that would enshrine rights to us to allow the free market to work and us to create higher living standards. So that would be what it would look like. And all of recorded history, because we never had decentralization and security together, would be based on that, that idea. And, and that idea is why, dem why democracy works better than communism, why, why all of these. But they all require some coordination of a, a trusted entity to protect us from the state getting too big, too big. And that coordination could be described in laws and rights. Um, as it is done in the in, in the U.S. and those charters become that social coordination of here's what we can do in this country. Look at what we can create, and it, it is the human spirit creating those ideas. But what ends up happening is over time, is the the money is more important to those ideas because the people with money can change the laws, or are on the right side of uh, or on the right side of this, or they can drag things out in court forever. Um, and the money gets to a point to a, to a point that the laws don't protect the people. The laws protect the people with money because the laws keep 
evolving and you, you remove your individual rights and freedoms and you transfer more power to the state, which is, or, or, or to individuals inside that benefit from those laws changing. And boy, is that, and, that on display right now? Holy yeah. It, it, and, and by the way, now just carry that forward. If, if, if that wasn't true, if what I just described wasn't true, um, then, then you would, you would suspect that the places with the most broken money would have the best laws protecting their citizens. And we see the exact, exact inverse, inverse throughout history. Um, and so it, 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 and, and that's tied into central banking itself. It's tied into the, so central banking is supposed to be an independence away from the state to be able to, but all central banks throughout time get coordinated and get co-opted by the state mm -hmm. as, as this moves because, and, and, and why this, this is natural is because when people are, when people are feeling like they're feeling today, they empower the state to solve the problem. They vote for more of what's hurting them the most to be able to, 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 uh, to, to solve their immediate pain. And it only makes the problem worse. So, if you ask somebody today, if you ask anybody today, if you ask, uh, if you, if you truly said to uh, any politician, what would you do out of this system? Would you reset the system? How would you reset the system? What would it look like? It, you'll see. If somebody said, "We're going to stop printing tomorrow, forever. We're never going to do that again, and money is going to be stable." Then our credit-based system, as we know it today, our way of life would collapse to the ground. Every single thing would fail. Yeah. Every bank would fail. Everything, because the entire thing is based on credit expanding. And if credit contracted and, and, and you didn't have enough of, a, of an economy to pay back the debt, the debt has, to, has to, to, to fail. That failing of the debt, the credit, is the system we live on. So you can guarantee no politician is going to tell you that, whether they even know it, um, because they're tied up in that misinformation of the system. So they have only uh, their only choice is to keep it going at an exponential rate. Keep keep this keep trying to kick the can down the road further, causing more pain. And we, as a as society, votes for them to do that, manipulating money further. As a result, manipulating our laws further, driving more coercion, more control into the state, and removing the free market function of society. I'm going to read a quote out of your article here that kind of hits at some of, some of this is what you're talking about right now. Because the existing system is credit-based, it cannot allow ongoing deflation without complete collapse because the credit would wipe out and the credit is the system. Society would never vote to have their entire way of living collapse, which means a paradox exists where society will always eventually insist on manipulated growth for fear of the consequence of collapse. And that manipulated growth is the primary source of the problem that society is dealing with, including environmental damage. So this last part, this last little note that's kind of slapped onto the end of this is where I want to go next. Um, and I got into this a little bit with uh, Michael um, asking him if, if there's an interconnection between energy not being infused into the money and all of this propaganda uh narrative control around environmental uh you know narratives that are out there how is this interconnected jeff many in bitcoin understand kind of uh, methane reductions in bitcoin gas flaring where where this moves and they and they fight head on at why we should use Bitcoin and why it's okay to use energy. Now, number one, and, and by the way, and by doing that, they they miss fighting on the higher ground. Mm -hmm. And Bitcoin owns the higher ground. Mm -hmm. The higher higher ground is this: that human coordination requires, and what we call that that trust linking the supercomputer requires more energy, not less. Mm -hmm. require it, it's a it's a race for more and more energy and every every developed nation in the world uses more energy for living standards so unless you want living standards to collapse uh, completely we have to find a way 
to increase energy a lot. Now, but the higher ground to that is you need a free market function to be able to do that. Mm. Because if you could just print more monetary units to create global wealth, then don't you think in the last 3,000 years, 5,000 years, societies would have figured that out? Um, and, 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 what you see, and what you see is you see um, those ideas driving us to more ener energy, better energy, better sources of energy are best left to entrepreneurs in the free market that are driving, driving that and misallocating that, misallocating through, that through misallocated resources by printing money creates the exact opposite. It, it tri drives energy scarcity. It drives confusion. It drives, it drives polarization of society where you don't get that drive for more and more pr productive energy because it has to be centrally controlled. That central control makes terrible decisions because they can't see all of the ideas in the free market. And so the, the higher ground is if that worked, then if these policies worked, based on manipulated money, more, more manipulated money for more growth. For, um, and, and remember, that growth is defined as GDP growth. And it's largely defined as G GDP growth because you have to pay back the debt. Mm. Um, and what's happening against that growth is you're getting a different type of growth, a growth that we really haven't seen or haven't seen at this scale is the productivity is typically net negative GDP. Where do all your extra photos you take today show up in GDP? Where does all the extra music you consume today? Where does your calculator app that you get for free show up in GDP? That pro those productivity gains are so profound. They drive down GDP. That's, yeah. the pro that's what productivity is typically. And so now you have less and less components of GDP that are able to pay back the debt and it relies, and so the entire thing, and the, 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 the credit that you have, and you have this credit problem that's growing exponentially, that presupposes you could grow forever on a, grow forever like, I'm, like the world's talking about now, grow forever on a finite planet. And the result of that is more and more people working harder and harder on one side, two jobs, three jobs, hamster wheel, trying to race to, uh, to, to buy more things to say it's in a system to, or to save enough money to escape the system, only making the system worse. And every single thing that you're doing on the other side on the free market, because the free market is trying to drive price down in your, in your, in your productivity up. And when you see those ideas, you use them fast. Mm -hmm. you, you, why you use Google, it gives you more value. Why you're using Zoom is it gives you more value. It connects us. You use them fast, and then what ends up happening is because those drive price down so much, or, or drive kind of that late, you have to you have to inflate worse. You have to, or you have to drive more credit to to keep up that Ponzi scheme. And that Ponzi scheme has diametric, like so many consequences for the world we're we're in because we measure that world from the system. And it, and it says we could grow forever. We could keep on doing this forever. We could manipulate money forever, um, which is not just higher consumption. It's higher production, it's higher consumption. It's most people need two jobs in their family or two, uh, two, two people working to do the same, to have the same thing that one person working 30 years ago would, would require. My, my first job as a lifeguard was I think I got paid twenty dollars an hour. That was in eighty six. Um, that twenty dollar an hour job as a lifeguard, um, it would in adjusted uh, uh, in adjusted terms would be sixty seventy dollars an hour today. What what lifeguards making? I, my kids were lifeguards this summer. They made sixteen dollars an hour. So they made less <laughs> that many years uh, later. Um, in real terms. And what you can see is why people are so frustrated by the system because they're racing harder and harder and harder based on a, based on something and they're objecting from the system. So they're saying, well, I can't make that work. So I'm just not going to, I'm going to trust the state to give me more money and the system gets stronger. And all of that is 
a system that can't solve if you believed in climate change is actually the creation of that climate change because it presupposes misallocation of capital and 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 monetary growth for forever in a system that just wastes our time let's talk a little bit about the point that you made about the requirement for more and more energy so i would suspect if there was an environmentalist listening to that uh and hearing you say that like they they can't get past that statement so help them understand your frame of reference of why you say that. So I think what they would what they would say, um, and 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 by the way, Alex Epstein's book that that oh, uh, yeah. it's a, it's fantastic on on, on this. Um, but their frame of reference would be CO two is bad for the atmosphere and energy is bad for that. So, oh, uh, mm. so and, and so we have to stop energy. Which, which, if they actually looked at their own life, they would never choose to stop stop energy. If they ever, if they wanted to go back to the Middle Ages, they would never choose that. They would, we would not realize, and that's why this is so. Um, it, I think it creates so much frustration mm -hmm. because we measure other people. We measure other people by their actions, and 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 we would take this very similar action and and complain about somebody else doing doing that and then we'd be on our uh, uh, covid described this perfectly to me as i saw it's, it's an area that my wife and i uh, kind of butted heads a bit and 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 i said I, I said i don't know a person i don't know any person that hasn't broken a covid law or, or covid rule well, sim simultaneously blaming other people for breaking COVID rules. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so what we choose for ourselves is very different than we would choose for other people. It was, it was what, that's the, what that gets at. And this, uh, this is why you can see a whole bunch of people preaching environmentalism and getting onto their private jets and going to conferences and, and creating the very thing. The, it, it's good for everybody else, but it's not good for me. And, and, and when you take that down to what countries are, will do in this race for more energy and the race to, for, for the citizens, why you can see as a natural consequence of that, many more coal-fired plants racing onto the market today because of disastrous policies in energy mm -hmm. and, and society needing more energy and more energy to drive their economies, to be able to, uh, to, be able to drive uh, to drive gains for their, um, for their people or live at higher living standards for their, their people. Because at the core of it, like if we're looking at the zoom call as a, as an example, like if we were going to have to do this in person, uh, whatever mode of travel you want to select for us to meet in person, to then have this conversation and then to try to distribute all of these, to yes. these recordings to individual people, like you just can't even wrap your head around the energy that would be consumed. If we took a snapshot in time from 20 years ago of how to perform that to a hundred years ago to a thousand years ago to perform that task. Um, and you look at the energy expense that would be associated with that. It would just be a, a, an ungodly parabolic shaped curve of of energy consumption to perform the same feat that we can do just seamlessly uh, with minimal effort today. And um, I guess that's, per that, that, that's, per that's perfect. Those ideas are creating higher uses of energy to save our time, mm -hmm. to, create, to create higher living standards. Mm -hmm. And when those uses create higher living standards, we use them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, it seems that so much emotion and so much qualitative uh, feelings have inserted themselves into um, what you would think would be a very quantitative process for deciding how we can uh, fulfill the, the energy requests uh, for how much demand there is for energy in the world. And it's just... Um, 
and I get it. I, I understand the whole CO2 side and I understand the, the need to, for, for methane and, and the damage that, that can happen if there aren't incentives to, to try to bring that away. But, you know, I mean, there's, there are people out there and, and this is kind of getting into the weeds. And I think you're trying to avoid this, Jeff, with, with how you answered your question. You're trying to avoid getting into the weeds and you're saying the argument to be had is way further upstream than the granularity of flaring methane, which Bitcoin the argument, yeah, the, 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 the highest, the highest point argument is, is this abundance and money create scarcity everywhere else, scarcity and energy scarcity yeah. everywhere, everywhere. And, and actually if you t- take climate damage, um, it makes that worse. Mm-hmm. Because it has to, it has to. So if you believed now, this is where the the nuance comes into to play. So you you look at the data of CO two emissions, and they're climbing radically. Now, some people would look at the, that data and say, and there's now there's a view, it's okay. That'll be there's a view by a, a small percentage of people, it's okay. That'll green the earth, and we need it anyways. Mm-hmm. Right. And there's a view from a large majority of people that that are, that creates climate change that destroys our planet. And so, how would you how would you attack that view from from driving into the large amount of people that believe that climate change is responsible for all this damage, um, and the CO two emissions are going to end life on this planet? And it's a very emotional response. How would you attack that? Uh, would you attack it from no, it doesn't, you're wrong, or would you attack it from tell me how more growth to credit, create a, to protect our credit system, destroying productivity, destroying living standards, and can solve the problem you're trying to solve? Yeah. And, 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 and for me, I just think, okay. There's this. There can be this debate on on this, but why would you have that debate? Because the the all. Of, why would you even start there? Because it's not the crux of the issue. It, yeah. Exactly, the crux of the issue is there is no solve to climate change through the system that actually creates the climate change that people that people believe is there, yeah. and whether or not you believe it's there or not is kind of a second. Uh, we could go into that. We could debate that CO two emissions, and then and then in that. Then the transition, the technological transition for better sources of energy, whether that those be nuclear, whether solar increase in output, battery increase in output, transitions that are our world to new energy sources. Now you need a pricing mechanism in the free market that combines energy and 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 creates instead of an incentive based on manipulation of money. You need a free market incentive that enhances a transition to abundance, which is Bitcoin mining. Mm -hmm. And and all energy companies will be Bitcoin miners. Energy and energy and Bitcoin are going to merge. Um, And and, and, and why and why you can see this, I can see this, why why many can't see it is because they don't understand how a market works. They don't understand how how a company to be able to deliver you more value has to be able to be profitable and has to be able to, to create returns, to be able to hire more people, to be able to create, uh, create more, more value. And you're, you're driving uh, that company must do that. And if you actually destroy that company's ability to do it, you destroy the function of what drives our living standards higher. And in this scenario, it, it's that that market is going to find a free and open market somewhere in the world. It, no matter what, yeah, no, no matter what. what. I was with, I was with Obi last night. He was just in Kenya. He was talking about uh, he was talk, he, talking about these what's happening with Bitcoin mining. He was integrating and providing abundant energy to villages, but energy at two cents uh, two cents a kilowatt hour. The the the, the um, that we don't see here because of, because of how much how much um, uh, you know, hydro energy they have, mm-hmm. and there wasn't an, an economic rationale before Bitcoin mining to be able to harness that for vill- villages. But mm-hmm. now there is, 
And so, so it literally changes the world and it changes in, in places that were most, that had kind of lowest energy use per capita and they couldn't plug into that to a network, now have a free market incentive to be able to capture en energy for their citizens. Wow. So profound. So it goes back to yeah. what we were talking about earlier as far as uh, starting in, in the grassroots and, and working its way up to, up to the top. Like uh, You're seeing that firsthand play out. I, I think one of the things that I've learned through doing 100 episodes is uh, Bitcoin mining is absolutely becoming part of energy inf infrastructure. Like it's not even uh, some of the conversations I've had with people that are in the energy space. I mean, it is just such an obvious addition that is slowly, especially in the larger markets, it's slowly getting there. But I think in some of the smaller locations, it is just, it, it is a must. It's a must. By the way, that's also connected to maybe a bigger, longer-term trend that uh, that we'll see play uh, play out. I, we, when we opened to this podcast, we talked about the race to cities for more ideas. Mm -hmm. Well, now once you have the inter internet and you have satellite communications, where you could be anywhere and you could be plugged into anybody, anyone, and those ideas can explode on the in internet. More and more ideas driving more social coordination, and you have energy that can be distributed instead of centralized. That means you don't require the same city. You can actually move to the energy, mm -hmm. clean, abundant energy, and you can power an entire, your, your entire way of life out of that decentralization. It doesn't take the centralization of coordination of a city mm -hmm. to get those ideas because we, we coordinate now more and more online. So, uh, Jeff, I know you've listened to both of the conversations that I had with Jason and Michael on all of this energy uh, proof of work uh, type things. Is there anything that you think that uh, is an important foot stomp or maybe something that maybe we glossed over or that you think is additive to a lot of their points that you think is important for people to understand about proof of work and energy? They're just different ways in this. Uh, 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 Jason's original frame, kind of describing war, is uh, is 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 effectively this uh, this fight imposing imposing your beliefs on somebody else, and and if you didn't do it, somebody else would do it to you, and that creating kind of a um, where we are game in game theory to today a shelling point where most weapons win. Um, in, in that show, of course, I thought that was a really brilliant insight. But I, but I thought the 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 words he described uh, he used to describe that insight and the fight potentially his ego protecting that fight didn't do him service in the community. Did some people, but like what an intelligent person. And then in this in the, your last interview, he actually described it in a different he described it in a different way, and they described yeah. it. That, that I thought I thought that. If you say a foot stomp, I, I, the domestication of animals to be able to be to be able to be our food was an interesting foot stomp in the way that we use that same hierarchy to uh, uh, for, uh, for for power. Um. So uh, and then in and Michael's again, it, he talks about uh, he talks about entropy. He talks about the second law of thermodynamics. So again, all of these ideas. Are just different ways in to the same concept to try to help refine these ideas for more and more, uh, more and more people, and they're all um, in, in, in the free market of ideas. Sometimes you say a word. I, I think about even this podcast for for uh, for you and I. I will either say something that's wrong, um, that's that I've not explained at a deep enough level to people that would make somebody understand why it's right or they're going to be looking at it through their frame of reference that they think it's wrong but it, it's it's right and so i can't control other people's how they they look through their frame of reference i can only control my frame of reference what i see so i see a different world because my frame of reference is a different world and so if you're um i use this in the book but if you said amazon to somebody in brazil they might not think a company. 
And so these words, <laughs> um, these words matter. Um, and these ideas, these debates matter. And all of these ideas are actually just refining kind of a complex, uh, what's happening with Bitcoin, a really complex and uh, new idea that changes the world. And that new idea is that decentralization and security that changes the world. To, today, if you're just trying to explain this idea, why it's so complicated, why it's also so fun, for really people that are curious is they can't stop learning because they, oh, wow, that one is so why I still listen to these interviews. The other people that you you have on is, ha, huh, that's a neat insight. And combined with this other insight that makes that, uh, uh, that uh, drives us forward. I'm, I'm really curious to see all of these insights and there are many people in the Bitcoin space. Um, so the sum total of that is more refinement of these ideas, creating a frame, more people coming over to that frame. And as more people come over to that frame, they infect others with those ideas and have better ways to communicate those ideas, which becomes the transition from one system to another system. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, uh, I just say, most of the why this is so hard right now is we're, we're talking about the plumbing. And what the plumbing means. Yeah. We're not talking. We're not talking about the products that live on top of the plumbing, that bring people on that they don't have to understand the plumbing. They they get value just as a natural extension of what we're talking of, of what we're talking about. We're not talking about all of the ideas that are building on top of this protocol and layer two and layer three solutions that bring on the next billions of people to Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, and and so. So I think that's another area of confusion, but also why people that are in it can see all of this hope and a better future. People who are not in it aren't down the rabbit hole enough. They're just operating through a different frame. When we look at the fundamentals, uh, I think most people in the space would just describe the price action and that's like their fundamental analysis. But I know... Uh, you, Lynn, um, others, they're looking at things like the hash rate, which literally tonight I saw has just hit a, a new all-time high. Um, probably, prob probably as a result, if you just say, why is the hash rate uh, hitting new? Uh, sometimes it's come at places like Kenya, finding cheaper sources of energy. Sometimes in, in this situation, I think it's probably more Ethereum miners racing to say, okay, I'm going to... I'm, now into this new system and all of that capacity coming on. Now that free market function will drive capitulation to some other miners that bought, bought high energy and high equipment prices and cause uh, capitulation. And some of that will come down and then restart again. But yeah, all sorry, keep, I cut you off. Well, no, just uh, the, the other fundamental thing that I think is really exciting right now is the lightning network. Lynn, and we're going to put this in the show notes, unreal write-up on the lightning network just recently that you put out um and when we look at the fundamentals there i mean it is just going i think the, the number she was throwing out like 400 percent annualized uh growth rate in lightning right now um i mean it's everything is is demonstrating that nothing is slowing this thing down if anything it's aggressively moving out despite uh the price action which you know, I suppose you would you would describe as being more of a function of the traditional system that you're comparing it to or, or measuring it against. Um, but what are your thoughts from a fundamental standpoint? How are you seeing Bitcoin right now? First, the price. I'm going to reinforce what you just said. When you're living in a system and you're measuring your house by that house value by that system, you're measuring it. You're going to the supermarket and you're buying food from that system, and you're marching against government or electing this person or this person out of that system um all of your time and energy is reinforcing the system that is producing the bad outcome for you and and then you're measuring the new system which operates on fundamentally different rules by the error code of that system so when you when you say price in us dollars price in um boulevards price in right you're 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 pricing it through the error code of the manipulation. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And so a new system, uh, this new system operates outside of that error code. And so um, it's just our description of it in our currency actually reinforces that we still largely live in this system, measuring our world and our value from the system that we're trying to get out of. Just, just that insight, just that insight, how much of your time do you spend against the old? And what you'd find is most of your time, most of our time is, and maybe not yours, maybe not mine, but it's in fact why I decided that just being on podcasts or writing wasn't enough. I'm going to go actively build. That's why we started EgoDAC. I'm going to go actively build. I'm going to spend way more of my time influencing the world I want to see mm-hmm. rather than complaining about the world I see. And the same thing is why I never, I don't think about price in Bitcoin. I really don't think about price of Bitcoin in any of these fiat currencies that have to debase. I think about it as a new system and what, the, what you have a network effect growing on Bitcoin, the, the asset. You have a, a network effect reinforcing that network effect now on the second layer. And what is to come building these products that are going to build, the, the, they're going to envision an entirely new world on top of this protocol. It changes everything. Um, and then I, then I think um, if you were an executive at Sears from 95 to 2010, you would, or Kodak or Blockbuster, you would have a frame of the way the world works and it would be true for you. And it would get more and more chaotic. And if you had to frame it, their competitor, Amazon, um, uh, Amazon, or or in, uh, Facebook and photos, or uh, or any of the Instagram and photos, um, or Netflix, you'd have a different frame of the world. Mm-hmm. And if you were operating in these two frames, you would see abundance, and you'd see all well, what we can do or you would say scarcity. And that frame, just different paths would determine your happiness in kind of that, uh, uh, in that frame. And so when I realize what's happening right now and, and, and kind of there's this new frame operating in the world and, and all of the hope and prosperity that comes out of it, I just want to spend more of my time in that frame, backing the best entrepreneurs, the best people that are building to that. And, and it's actually what you feel in the Bitcoin community is almost that love that you feel in the Bitcoin community because it's it's kind of, it's almost a mission. It's beyond just uh, most people. It's not about Bitcoin price at all. It's about imagining a, 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 a world with truth, hope, and abundance and, and building towards that world. Amen to that. If we had somebody that was an influencer within the G20 listening to the conversation, uh, what would you want their, their takeaway to be? I would want their takeaway to, to, to be, um, there is a way to transition to this. And the existing system that, they, that they're, they're reinforcing for their kids and everything else will, will ensure our world uh, is a really dangerous place. Unless somebody can come up with a with a plausible why I just said isn't true, because I haven't seen it, um, it just gets worse and worse. And you know from right from my book, all of these things and what we would do and turn against each other as a result of this. It's all described in my book that you uh, that that, that um, so you can predict what happens to human nature out of a system that is based on corruption. What would be the emergent complex be? Uh, let's say based on manipulation, but would be what would be our emergent complex behavior look like in a system that was based on manipulation or a theft in the in the system? And I understand why that system is kept on keeps on repeating throughout time, and it gets to gets to a place, and then you go to war, and you reset the system, and. Uh, and, and then you start again and it gets away on itself again because it's, off, it's that credit-based system for velocity of money. But Bitcoin operates totally different. And that's, uh, that new system changes all of the rules for how we design society to, to something that is fundamentally different. One of the problems is because if you said a, somebody senior in G20 
because they're carrying their baggage of these rules into the new system. They can't see what we just said. They're, they're, you're carrying all the biases of how the system has to work into the new system. In fact, it's exactly why a company like Kodak doesn't create the digital camera because you can't see your way to, to see the value in a different a different way. You can't see that, that value. So if you're open to understanding it, then you're also open to be able to transition to it faster. And if you're open to transition to it faster, what you're actually doing for your citizens, for your future, for the future of humanity, what you're doing is speeding a path and creating more abundance, higher living standards for, uh, for the people you care about. I suspect that many of the people that we're talking about in that system won't see that, won't take the time to see it, and new people will be elected to see it um, in time, but it doesn't change the fact that, that that's happening. And it's happening at a faster and faster rate all the time. Any closing thoughts, ideas? But going back to one of the things that we, we just talked about, choose your frame. Once you've chosen your frame, spend more time in that frame. Spend more time because your time, your time matters more than you think it does. Your time, uh, the, what we don't realize is, so when we say, you see on Twitter, those people, those people conspiring against us. And that's a choice of our time to reinforce that. And what, 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 a, bun, what a bunch of other people are doing is using that too. So, so it actually makes that system stronger because it's easy to, to, to look at that small group of people and say, those people are crazy. It makes that system stronger. Whereas if you just focus on the builders, Focus on what, what, what Matt O'Dell says, stay humble and stack stats. What, uh, um, focus, on, focus more of your time on the world you want to see. Yeah. And you'll, you'll have so much, you, you, you won't believe how much influence you have on the world that you're, going to, that, you're going, that you're creating. And that goes for every single one of us. We all matter. Yeah. The reciprocal is something I don't think humans have uh, an appreciation for. I know I don't. Um, I, I know it's there, but actually internalizing how powerful that reciprocal is of, of an idea or just an act kind of flowing through humanity. Like I'm pretty sure it's way more profound than I, than I, or anybody can really kind of wrap their head around. Yeah. I use this as a way to describe that from a, from these, these ideas, you know, you know, on our first podcast, I talked about the victim and uh, uh, archetype and the victim uh, and the victim archetype. And I didn't mean to do it in, in a negative way, but the victim archetype, why are they a victim? They want more love, right? Mm-hmm. They want be- more, but more belonging. They don't want to be a victim. They, they're the way they, uh, uh, they get more love is to be, become a victim. And then as it, everybody pushes away from them further and further. Mm-hmm. They can't see it, so they typically create more drama to try to get everybody to come back. And so I find that profoundly sad, but but I find that's in all of us as we search for that in our own in our in, in our own way. Because what that describes is that 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 love is all around that person all the time, but their frame of the world mm. is preventing them from achieving it. Yeah. And it's just their frame of the world. It's all it is because, because I don't have the same frame. I see abundance everywhere and I see the good in people and it, it's a mirror reflection and it comes back and, and it comes, it comes back to me. And I, and so I, I see opportunities everywhere. And then, then I take that example and I say, okay, if you're in a, if you're in a room with a hundred people and you're in a room with other people, you're having a conversation, and you, you and I have talked about this too, in a P3 wave, that conversation creates a P3 wave in your brain as it cascades your neurons and, you, and you're tuned in that conversation. But if somebody across the room quietly said, Preston, a new P3 wave would form and you would listen to that conversation and you would even not hear mine. And so, so, so what, that, what that says is, is so you're aware of all the conversations in that room all the time, but you're not really consciously aware of that conversation. Um, and, and if you, and if you just describe that means those conversations are happening, but we're not tuned into them. Mm-hmm. 
because our focus, our frame, can't see them. So now to use the same example, if you if you said Bitcoin quietly in a room, all of us would, wow, I don't need to talk to that person. Whereas, whereas most people wouldn't even hear the word. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and, and so our ideas really do create our attention, which creates uh, those, those thoughts, create our attention, create the world we see because more and more momentum moves to the moves uh, uh, to those ideas. And when we're open to those ideas, we see more opportunities. Jeff, I could literally talk to you all night. Um, I can't thank you enough for coming on. It, it's important to me that you were my hundredth guest. Um, you, you have influenced my thinking tremendously. Um, in fact, I would describe your book as kind of like the final puzzle piece of kind of something that was missing out of my framework. Um, or at least, and I think that that might be egotistical for me to say that, that my framework's even complete, but, um, and it's not. But it had a very profound impact on how I how I view uh, macroeconomics, um, how I how I view Bitcoin, and why I think Bitcoin's so important. And so it was just I was really excited that you were coming on as as the hundredth guest on this you know Bitcoin fundamental show that that I started I don't know how long ago about two years ago now. Um, and uh, thanks for making time. And and the exact I cannot believe when I say uh, the the tremendous gratitude I have for you and many of others in this space that have become to me lifelong friends mm-hmm. as a result of of what we're doing that curiosity and driving and deeper thoughts and awareness and 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 building to this new future it is like. What a time to be alive. It's scary. The existing world is scary. It's going to, ex- in, in the existing system, you expect the unexpected. It's going to get a lot worse. And, and so building more of my time into the system with people like you, um, what an honor. Yeah, likewise. Um, any uh, things you want to highlight? We'll have links to this article that you wrote. I definitely want to have a link to Lynn's uh, Lightning Network uh, write up that she recently did. Anything else that you want us to have links to, or that you want to highlight? No, probably not. The one thing that I would get people to follow what some of the venture capital in this space is investing in, and so, and I'm specifically talking about the like ego death, but not just ego death. Ten thirty one, Tremel, other Bitcoin only funds, because what you're going to see is uh, see an explosion of ideas and some of those ideas are going to radically remake our world and they're going to accelerate this this adoption path for way more people. I can't believe I get to, we've, we've seen 320 companies. Um, it, we've done diligence on 320 companies so far. So there are so many, that you can't say yes to them, uh, them all, but the ideas that are coming are so exciting. So just stay tuned for some of what, uh, what's, what's coming. It's just amazing. What a space. What a time to be alive. Jeff, thanks for your time. Thank you. It's just very important that people see the stakes. Yeah. $500 trillion with 10 to $20 trillion you know, pouring Amen. down the drain every year. Amen. Versus 500 trillion. What happens to the 500 trillion when we close the drain? Yes. You get $20 trillion worth of prosperity per year. 